Today we celebrate Easter, the day Christ rose from the dead. It's a time where we love to lift up our voices and sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia! And up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. We love to sing these words, and for good reason. The message they proclaim brings us both joy and hope. It's a message that sets our spirits soaring. Something so very good has happened to the world and us who live in it that we have to celebrate. But as true as all this is, the joy and hope we receive from Easter can be rather fleeting, unless, that is, we remember something else. People expect to hear good news on Easter, and they do. But for that news to be good, truly good, it also has to be terrifying. We're familiar with news that is bad and terrifying. We've heard plenty of this in the last few months with the coronavirus. Global cases have now topped 1.6 million, with global deaths standing at over 81,000. In the U.S., cases have topped 400,000, and deaths are over 12,000. These figures cast a dark shadow over our lives. It's frightening what is happening. People losing their lives, losing their health, losing their jobs, maybe even losing their homes. Schools closed, businesses closed, communities on lockdown, church sanctuaries empty, authorities telling us not to gather in groups of more than 10. And when we do come together, we got to practice social distancing of six feet or more. It's unprecedented in what has happened. And scary. Yes, we are familiar with news that is bad and terrifying. We're going through that kind of news right now, and it threatens to shake the foundation of our lives, unless, unless we remember something else. And that something else is the news of Easter, which is both good and terrifying. Let's turn to the Easter story as recorded for us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It all began the day before in a peculiar way with a request from the chief priests and the Pharisees who met Pilate on the Sabbath. The very fact that a meeting like this took place is peculiar in itself, for this was a breaking of the Sabbath by these religious leaders, something they had accused Jesus of doing. Still, they went ahead with the meeting, presenting an even more peculiar request. 
the setting of a guard over a tomb. Seems kind of ridiculous when you think of it, posting armed soldiers for keeping watch over a tomb with a dead corpse in it. And yet, this was the request. In all the annals of history, we don't find anything like this ever being done. Everyone knows that once dead, the dead do not come back to life. Death is a power which once in its grasp, no one can break. It's the ultimate prison from which no one returns. Pilate certainly knew this, and the religious leaders did too. But it wasn't this that the religious leaders were afraid of. Yes, they recalled how Jesus said, destroy this temple, referring to his body, and in three days I'll raise it up. But such a prediction only proved in their minds that Jesus was the liar, the imposter they always considered him to be. The Messiah will not suffer and die and then be raised up. The Messiah reigns in power. What power did Jesus have now, now that he's dead? No, what they were afraid of was that some of Jesus' disciples might come at night to steal the body. But really, what purpose would this accomplish? Now, people are not so gullible to believe a person would rise from death without some proof. What would the disciples do? Prop up a body like a living thing in simulation of a resurrection? And yet, this was the fear these religious leaders had. Now, it's amazing how fear can lead people into taking some bizarre actions. Jesus was dead, yet they still feared him in death. Pilate gave in to the absurdity of the request and let them place a guard over the tomb, and as an extra measure of safekeeping, sealed it with a rock. Now the three greatest powers in the world stood vigilance over this corpse. The power of death with its inescapable grip, the power of nature with the sealed rock in front of the tomb, and the power of Rome with armed guards standing watch. With their fears relieved, the religious leaders were now confident that no power on earth could possibly change things from what they were. At the breaking of dawn on Sunday morning, two women make their way through the gates of the city down the winding path to the garden tomb. Carrying spices, they had come to care for the body of their deceased friend, Jesus of Nazareth. Their hearts are heavy with grief, their eyes downcast. As they make their way to the tomb, their concern for anointing the body of Jesus becomes outweighed by their concern for how they would move the sealed stone in front of the tomb. Nobody would dare unseal the stone and roll it away from them. And because of the guards, nobody could. The women will have to content themselves with just gazing at the tomb. Coming to the entrance of the tomb, something wholly unnatural and unexpected takes place. A violent earthquake shakes the ground and an angel of the Lord descends from heaven and rolls away the stone. So great was this earthquake and awesome the angel that the guards are struck with terror. The guards, in an ironic reversal of events, now seem dead. But why? Now what had happened that these war-hardened soldiers should suddenly be so frightened that they act like dead men? Is it the earthquake and the angel that fills them with such terror? Or is there something more, something even greater than these things? Well, the words of the angel to the women tell us, do not be afraid, for I, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Now that's an earth-shaking announcement that's going to change everything of what you think you know about this life. You see, nothing like this has ever happened in the whole history of the world. Dead men don't rise from the dead, but Jesus did. Nothing in all the training these soldiers received or in all of life experiences could prepare them for what happened. They could only stand powerless before this earth-shaking event, just as the power of death and the power of nature stood powerless. Here before them was a power greater than anything in or of the world. 
Years later, the Apostle Paul spoke of this incomparable power. This power, he wrote, is like the working of God's mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in his heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. What took place in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was an awesome demonstration of God's mighty power displayed in Jesus. No wonder the earth shook and terror filled the soldiers, soldiers and the women were afraid. God Almighty was at work in this. But not only did this event shake the earth from beneath the feet of these men and women, it also shattered the beliefs of the religious leaders, the soldiers, the disciples, and indeed the whole world. Everyone is left reeling in the wake of this event. For you see, Jesus' resurrection proved that he is not the liar, the imposter, the Jewish religious leader said he is. The resurrection proves Jesus is the Son of God, God's anointed Messiah, the light of the world, the heavenly bread come down from heaven that feeds us to an eternal life with God. The resurrection reveals for all the world to see that Jesus' words are true and that he is the very one who is Lord of life. It was no wonder then that we read these women leaving the tomb frightened. They didn't know what to make out of it all. Mark in his gospel emphasizes the frightened nature of these women even more so than Matthew. Mark writes, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. These women were terror struck by what had happened and couldn't get out of that cemetery fast enough. And yet it's not the terror of bad news that has filled them. It is a terror infused with the good news of God. A terror that paradoxically is able to give birth to a hope and joy that will never end. A terror that says, I want to believe this, but I'm afraid it's just too good to be true. Now this is the part Matthew captures. As he writes, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. You see, one more thing had to happen before the women are jolted completely out of their terror. They had to meet the risen Lord Jesus himself. And they do. Suddenly Jesus meets them. And he greets them. And what he says to them is very illuminating. He says, rejoice. Now, you won't find any of the translations of the Bible putting it this way. Instead, you'll read greetings or hail or even good morning. But the word is rejoice. And it's significant in light of the terror these women experienced. For Jesus' presence now turns the women's terror into joy and celebration. Rejoice, he says. The implication being, I was dead, but now I'm alive. Rejoice, be glad, a new day is dawned. A day God has made possible, the day of salvation, where God will now make his dwelling with humankind, and no one can take this salvation away. No earthly power can defeat it. Not sin, death, the devil, or Rome. Well, that's certainly cause to rejoice. Good news has entered the world. And with this good news, the women worship Jesus. They fall at his feet and worship him. You can see now how the terror of Easter is something that shakes the foundation of our lives. It's unprecedented. Nothing like this has ever happened in the world before. And look at what it does. It tells us that what happened that first Easter morning was truly of God. The resurrection was not some tricky heist the disciples pulled off. This was the power of God at work, the power of God raising Jesus from the dead. The fear of the chief priests and Pharisees, the terror of the soldiers, and the fear of the women all bear witness to this. God raised Jesus from the dead. That's something that shakes the foundation of our lives. We can't ever be the same again if we're really hearing what this is saying. But what's so novel with the terror of Easter in contrast to the terror found in the world is that it's filled with God's goodness. 
It's not bad. Rather, it's the best news the world has ever heard and gives rise to unbridled celebration. Now, the world, the world tries to water this down by saying Easter is a time to celebrate birth and renewal. Winter is over, spring has come, and things are soon going to bloom. So let's be happy and celebrate. Admittedly, that approach to Easter is much easier to handle than the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You know, what do you do with that? But that's exactly the point of the Easter story. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead shakes up your whole belief system. Even more than that, it shakes up your whole life. For it is really not what you and I seek to make out of this event. It's wholly the other way around. It's what Jesus, who is raised Lord of life, seeks to make out of you and me. Jesus has risen in power and is Lord over all. And so the question is, what is our response to this? Well, we should bow down and worship him just like the women did. That's really the only appropriate response. And the terror of Easter reminds us of this. But that's not the only thing this terror-filled event does. The risen Lord Jesus Christ has a word for us. Rejoice, he says. Rejoice, a new day has come, the day of salvation. With Jesus as Lord of life, we are now assured that nothing will separate us from his love. Nothing in life and nothing in death. The curse of sin and evil and death has been broken. The terror that these things have brought into the world are overcome by one more powerful. No longer do these things rule and dominate our lives. Christ the Lord now rules. He dominates. And his word to us is rejoice. That, my friends, is a word that is relevant for today, tomorrow, and always. And especially, especially in facing this pandemic. We can rejoice, folks. The victory is the Lord's. This coronavirus isn't going to win. This anti-God force is not going to prevail. There is one more powerful who is Lord of this earth, Jesus Christ. And his command for us to rejoice bears witness to the truth that nothing is going to defeat his saving purposes for this world and for us who receive him as Savior and Lord. Well, it's no wonder that we, we celebrate Easter. Good news has entered the world. Infused with that good news, well, we have to go and tell others about it, just like the women did. There is hope and joy for people to know, even when we're confronted with a pandemic like what we're going through now. We don't have to despair. We don't have to live in fear. We can rejoice. Christ the Lord has risen. And he, he is bigger and more powerful than any crisis we face. Praise be to him. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. We thank you for the good news that has entered this world and how it shakes our lives up and turns us to you. Help us to receive him as our Savior and Lord. We ask that your Spirit would so work in our hearts and minds that it gives us confidence to face whatever difficulties come in our life. Lord, we think of this pandemic that has come into the world and into our country. But we know, Lord, that you are greater than this. And so we put our faith and confidence in you. And we look to you for our salvation. Now we give you all praise, honor, and glory. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen.